Mr. Burke, do you have some remarks? Thank you, Trustee Aguilar. Good morning, everyone. I'm opening up the chat function. Please state your name and board agenda item you would like to address. The chat feature will be open for two minutes. When you get we get to the public comment section of the board agenda, I will call on you by your name and you will be able to unmute your mic and address the board at that time. Thank you. So we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the adoption of the agenda. Uh, Jennifer, will you call the roll, please? Yes. yes. I got that echo back. Yeah, I can't. I can't understand what you're saying. Mike. Yeah. Trustee Corkin? Here. Trustee Meek? Here. Trustee Carter? Here. Trustee Gomez Heisberg? Here. Trustee Jimenez? Here. Here. Trustee Aguilar? Trustee Aguilar, you're, you're on mute. Here. And Trustee Scribner is absent. That concludes. Okay. The Thank you. So that brings us to C. Uh, Tom, do you want to discuss the succession planning for the CEO position? Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, Don't we need an adopt motion to adopt the agenda? Yes. Oh, so yes. So oh, that's correct. Uh, motion by motion to approve the agenda or adopt the agenda by Trustee Meek. Is there a second? Corkins. Second. Okay, we have a second by Trustee Corkins. Jennifer, will you pull the board? Yes. Trustee Corkins? Yes. Trustee Meek? Yes. Trustee Aguilar? Yes. Trustee Carter? Yes. Trustee Gomez Heitzberg? Yes. Trustee Jimenez? Yes. yes. Trustee Meek? Yes. That concludes the vote. Thank you. Okay, so the next item is discussion. It's a discussion item regarding the succession planning for the CEO position, Tom. Yes, thank you, Trustee Aguilar. Uh, as you can see, uh, Academic Search Services has uh, refined uh, the timeline for uh, the search for the chancellor. And based on the feedback uh, from the board, they have developed a um, very uh, aggressive timeline. Uh, this uh, timeline uh, basically would position the board to have uh, made a decision uh, on finalists um, by uh, early January, late December, early January, uh, with a uh, potential start date of either March uh, or July 1, depending on what is negotiated with the um, the uh, uh, finalists uh, for the position. So at this point in time, I'd ask if there's uh, any questions regarding the, the calendar. I'll open it up to members of the board for any comments or questions at this time. Trustee Agbalad? Yes. Um, I, as I'm looking at this, uh, Tom, maybe you can help me. Where is it that we talk about, where the board talks about what they want to see in a chancellor? So I believe that's in the uh, August 8th timeframe, basically. Uh, hold on. August 8th description. Yes. Yeah, position description, fall 2020, MOQ, DOQ, all that. Yeah. There's oh, a meeting, I see it. I was, meeting with, okay. with the board. Okay, I, 
just wanted to emphasize the importance, uh, I think the importance, and I hope my colleagues would agree with me, of the district continuing to work cooperatively uh, across the district. Um, it seems like we've we've hit a very positive point, thanks to you, Chancellor uh, Burke and Chancellor Christian, and uh, want to see that continue for the betterment of the district as a whole. Um, I have, this is this is uh, Trustee Aguilar. Tom, I have some comments. You know, we've had an opportunity to talk about this issue now just a couple of times, and I've had some time to think about some of the decisions and the direction that we've given in the past regarding this issue. And I'm feeling more and more uh, the need to have a trustee representative. And for some of the reasons, um, well, one of the reasons is Trustee Gomez Heitzberg mentioned, uh, a lot has been done to um, get people working together and the three colleges working together in a collaborative fashion. And I'd really like to make sure that that continues. You know, I, I know that um, the committee will be comprised of different people, but I really think that the board's perspective uh, needs to be there. And um, for those reasons, I'm, I'm leaning towards uh, placing a trustee representative back on the uh, committee. All right. I'd like to speak to that. Um, trustee me. Um, Tom, on your, under September 11th and 14th on your timeline, you've got search committee roster finalized, including a board of trustee participation. Yeah, I think that that there was an anticipation okay. uh, of a potential uh, change in direction. Yeah, and that know, was included. I think you all know how strongly I feel about this because it, this is the uh, one of the most important hires district wide and um, our hire. I'd like to suggest that Trustee Gomez Heitzberg. Um, be placed as the board of trustee participation she's um she has a really unique perspective that that we haven't had before she's been on both sides of the fence and um i think she's been on the board long enough and certainly with her past experience she's gonna um be able to oversee it and um even though she's a non-voting member um, she'll be able to bring back to the full board when we look at these um, nominees as they move forward of um, how the, they'd work in the college and how they'd work on the board also. Thank you. Romeo, Thank you. I'd yes. like to speak to that as well. Sure, Trustee Carter. Oh, okay. Say, I'm just wondering why doesn't why if we have a trustee on that committee, why are they non-voting? Uh, trustee Carr, the reason is is they they will have to vote on the on the finalists on the final decision. Well, they'll get a vote there, but why why wouldn't they get a vote when the you know when the because all we're all they're doing is thinning out the ones we don't want, right? Um, so why wouldn't we get a, a I, I think the trustee should have a vote is all I'm saying. Hey, Any other hang comments? On, hang on a second. Uh, Romeo, hang on a second. Sure. I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking at Grant. And it's an investment to your limited term ad hoc advisory, right? It's, it's a, uh, screening committee essentially. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think it's more a matter of protocol but, and I can see the two philosophies. One is, or it, does that give one trustee kind of, um, a lot more authority than the board in being able to make that vote early on, or is that okay with the board? But I think legally so that's okay with the board then we can move forward with the direction that they stand with the board yeah. Yeah. okay so uh uh grant hernan advised us that um as long as the board is comfortable with uh a trustee having two bites of the apple essentially to influence the uh, outcome of the chancellor search 
he doesn't see uh, that there's a, uh, an issue at that. It's really up to uh, where the board's comfort level is. Is that thinking about in terms of Brown Act, if that's a concern, if we have non-board members on the committee, then it will be a Brown Act by, by that arcane definition of which bodies are subject to the Brown Act. The only way to avoid the Brown Act is to have a limited term advisory committee consisting only of less than a quorum of members. So if you want to avoid the Brown Act, that committee could be composed of you know, up to three board members Others could advise the committee, but if they're formally on it, it's going to trigger the brand. Boom. Uh, I was just advised as well that uh, if the way we structure the screening committee with a trustee on it, that could trigger a Brown Act uh, uh, issue. Any committee that the board sets up that has non-board members on it triggers this again arcane definition in the brown act meaning you're going to have your meetings will have to comply the only safe harbor is if the committee were composed only of less than a quorum of board members those other folks that you want to have input could advise but if they're on the committee it's a brown act body which you know this okay so the workaround is to have an ad hoc committee of the board of three and then the 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 uh, screening committee then acts as a recommending body to the ad hoc committee. Support rather than and support. Well, let me ask this question. How have we done this in the past? I mean, this isn't the first time we've selected a chancellor where we've had a trustee sitting on a committee. How did we do it the last two times? We've only had one trustee participate in all of our committees. It's obviously less than the quorum. So... I'm not certain I understand what the hiccup is here. Why can't we do this the same way that we've always done it? And why are we just learning about this issue now? If they were an ex officio on that committee, would that have? have uh, so it's not that you can't do it. It's just that it would be a Brown Act body if you have non-board members on there. And I'm not sure. I mean, your former general counsel and I have that specific conversation many, many times. And we're pretty much in lockstep on how that definition works. But it's not that you can't do it. It's just that the, those meetings would be Brown Act meetings. If, those, even if the trustee was an ex officio on the committee? Right, if it's a board-created committee. So let's say you created a board committee only of staff. That's going to be a Brown Act body. The only safe harbor is a committee of less than a quorum, uh, exclusively board members. This is a committee less than a quorum. I, I mean, it's not even a committee. Well, he, he says what complicates it, Kay, is that we're bringing in non-board members to a, a, a temporary committee, which it is, uh, and that he's indicating that that sets up a violation of the Brown Act. It's or a requirement to-, to or, or a requirement to notice the meetings uh, according to the Brown Act. Well, what's wrong with just doing it as, as in compliance with the Brown Act. I Nothing. Mean, because it's Nothing. a personnel issue, it's going to be in closed session anyway. Correct? Yeah, we would just have to notice that the meetings are and just occurring. I mean, I don't see a problem with that. And just yeah. and just do the one person. Yeah, we could do that. Romeo, just um I don't know. I don't know why uh, we didn't follow the Brown Act in the past. So, well, how do you know we didn't follow the Brown Act in the past? Well, I, I know the last they were noticed. Yeah, I I don't think they were. So, but we certainly can do it now. And you know, and the the trustee sitting there, you're going to find out that even though you may not be voting, that committee is going to turn to you and ask you questions because. Right. You, you you know you're just kind of you're kind of policing but you're also there as you know to answer questions that they might have so what we'll do essentially is we will notice that the uh, screening committee's meetings they'll be in closed session and um we'll just have to do a do we have to do a formal open and then close okay so we can do that by zoom 
So, so that's that is doable, Kay. So, I bet mean, uh, that's just my opinion. I have a process question, uh, Trustee Agbala. If, ahead, if it is uh, if it is a Brown Act and the agenda is posted, then does that open the open the opportunity for comments from the community? Yes. About yes. anything that's on the agenda. Yes. Yes. That's correct, Nan. Only the items on the agenda. But it would be limited to only the items on the agenda. We would well, do this, this could be special meetings, couldn't it? Yes. Yeah, these these could be uh, we could manage these through special meetings. Still, it would it opens, as I understand it, it opens up the discussion, the opportunity for a discussion about the position of searching for the chancellor's position. In light of that, I want to go back and, and get clarification, at least for myself, from um, on the if there were three trustees assigned to the screening process for chancellor and the screening committee then reported to those three trustees we wouldn't do the brown act is that that's a question not a statement so trustee gomez heitzberg yeah that's that's correct if you had a board committee consisting of one two or three trustees only they're the only committee members but they get input from other people, other stakeholders. That could be set up in such a way that you would not have to post the meetings. So it'd be an ad hoc committee. Yeah. So we have two options before us, correct? Correct. Couldn't you do both? Uh, I don't think he could do both. He's well. I, I'm gonna, I'm going to restate my position. I think that we need to go back and have a trustee representative on a committee the way that we had for the last two chancellor searches. And if they've got to follow the requirements of the Brown Act, so be it. That's what the law says, and that's what we're going to do. And I don't have an issue whatsoever with Trustee Gomez Heitzberg serving as that representative. She knows the inner workings of the colleges. She was an administrator there. She's a trustee. Uh, I think she understands very well uh, this board and the direction that it wants to go. Uh, she has a very keen understanding of process, and I think that uh, she would be a valuable addition to that committee and would serve as a resource to that committee should members of the committee have any questions about the board sentiments or process or anything else for that matter. I think she's very well equipped to be our representative. And I would second that as a motion. I just like to say one more thing. You know, when Nan, you're talking about a, a discussion, uh, a discussion is when people talk back and forth. Mm -hmm. uh, if someone wants to address that body, is there, am I right, Grant, to just listen, just like we are in any public comment? Mm -hmm. Right. And that would have to be an education process to the entire committee uh, because the entire committee is not normally used to that, that, that if there was someone there, they are only there to listen and not respond. Understood. Trustee um, Agbala, permission to speak? Sure. <laughs> um, I think... Uh, in the past, uh, the, the issue has to do with the screening committee is actually appointed by the chancellor. So um, if you look at it this way, um, the board is appointing someone to the chancellor appointed uh, committee. So when I sent out the notices, it's always been in that breath on behalf of the chancellor, we're convening a screening committee and the chancellor is tasked with um, making sure that it is staffed properly. So um, that's my easy explanation as to why um, it was allowable in the past and didn't require the, the, the Brown Act. Um, but nonetheless, we, we, we can 
continue on and and uh, I've heard the board's wishes and um, be happy to make that happen and make sure that we're in compliance. Well, Abe, thank you for that clarification in light of that now. Why can't we just add a trustee representative to the chancellor's um, screening committee? And if it's a committee that the chancellor puts together, I think, you know, you've got at least a motion in a second here, if that's what you need right. from members of the board to appoint trustee Gomez Heitzberger. Am I getting a sense that there's opposition to that from the chancellor? So just to comment on Vice Chancellor Ali's uh, comment, it is possible for the chancellor to have committees that aren't subject to the Brown Act where uh, he is selecting the members and they're advising him. I'd have to research though, having a board member on that committee, um, whether that is a Brown Act event or not. I apologize, I didn't have the background on how we've done it in the past, but. Um, so I'd also, also, need to remind and, and advise Grant that the part part of the composition of the uh, screening committee is driven by board policy. And Grant, I don't know if that impacts the yeah I definitely can take a look at that. I hate to hold. Okay. So why don't we um, so I'd ask is the board is there a consensus of the board if uh, we uh, to proceed with Trustee uh, Gomez Heisberg to be on the screening committee and then uh, subject to a follow up review of uh, the requirement to uh, follow the Brown Act with regards to uh, the screening committee's activities. I don't have a problem with that, but I don't want it to change the timeline at all. I, I was just going to state the same thing. Obviously, eighth is the next one. <laughs> so that's okay. So we, I guess we have to pick a theory today to get this committee in motion. Um, oh no 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 no! The we have time because the committee can't meet until the faculty essentially have returned. The faculty have to return from the summer recess. To, to make their recommendations to me okay. on their participation. Okay. So we have some time for you to do the research. Okay. So. Well, the structural makeup of the committee can be determined now. Um, finding out who the individual members will be from faculty and other groups, I mean, that can come later, but I think we can establish what the structure of the committee should look like now. Yes, correct? That, you're correct. Trustee Aguilar. We've got that done. I mean, you just pull it from the last one, unless, unless you're going to make changes to it. Th so basically, the only, the only, we have the structure that we presented to you at the last board meeting. The only uh, question now was whether or not uh, a trustee was going to participate in the screening committee or not. Okay, well, that's, that's been answered. So is there a consensus of the board for Nan to be the representative? Yeah. Yes. 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 Yep. Okay. And she gets the vote, right? Yes. <laughs> I'm kidding you. Well, we don't want to send you, send you in there with an unloaded gun. <laughs> I've been pretty effective with a pretty effective without uh, ammunition, Kyle. <laughs> Wait till you get loaded up. Let's see what happens. Okay. So, Tom, you have consensus from the board to proceed with the trustee representative as a participant on this uh, committee. Uh, if there are no further uh, comments or questions, shall we move on to the next okay. item? This is a discussion on the um, um, legal counsel. Yes. I, um, trustee Aguilar, I'd like to ask. Uh, uh, CF, CFO Mike Giacomini to uh, give a briefing on that on that report. Morning, trustees. Um, so I put together an analysis with some with some help in the district um, to kind of go over the history of the general counsel and some of the challenges that we've had 
um, since the retirement of Chris Hine. Um, so I'm gonna go through this briefly because this has already been included, but uh, this started back in 2013 um, where we, uh, we brought in uh, in-house counsel for the first time as a district. And we've been having in-house counsel up until uh, July 1st of this past year. So we've been basically 12 months now without general counsel um, at this point in time. Um, amongst all the community colleges, the 70 districts, all of the large um, multi-college districts for the most part have in-house general counsel and have had in-house general counsel for a number of years and several other larger single college districts have their own general counsel as well. Um, not to say that we have to follow suit, but it is uh, they, they see a value in having it um, given the complexities of running a multi-college district or a large district as uh, if you're not multi-college as well. Um, and just because of the size and not necessarily the geographic size, which we know is, is, is enormous for us, but um, the size and the number of uh, individuals that we do uh, employ, as well as the vast number of students that we do serve, um, does create a lot of intricacies and challenges um, and increases the opportunity for a litigious environment. Um, so as we continue to grow, it does in continue to increase our chances for having uh, more and more activity in that arena. Um, but we believe that having somebody in-house can potentially offset that when you have somebody that is completely um, Im embedded into the situation and looking out for the best interests of the district. Um, you're looking for somebody here that is providing a centralized mechanism to coordinate all the legal matters. And, and I think that's um, something that, you know, we're kind of struggling with a little bit and in, 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 in trying to fine tune this past year is having that, you know, that one person kind of be the central location that's responsible for kind of ensuring that the kind of that all, all a cart method of, of, of servicing our um, legal needs through third parties is meeting the needs of the district in a timely manner and uh, trying to still make it cost effective because that would be kind of the nature of the approach of going this a la carte method would be try to be more cost effective. Um, however, it does, uh, does create some challenges for us. And so um, as we look through some of those challenges, some of it really has to do with coordination and integration. Um, you know, ensuring that you're obviously having somebody in house, they have a special skill set. They have somebody that uh, understands the law and the intricacies of it, isn't an expert in everything, but is still going to need some a third party help in certain matters, but is going to be somebody that can take that advice from the third party, position it against our board policies and against, you know, the, the mission and the objectives of the district. Um, to ensure that it is the best advice and um, that the so that the board and the chancellor can make the correct decisions that aren't just in compliance with law, but also serve the mission and the best interest of of the district. Um, another thing that be, has become uh, evident in the past 12 months is, you know, having that person in house uh, or not having that person in house anymore, it does create uh, a lag when you're looking for uh, a quick response. If you have an emergent time frame, um, you know, uh, is if as 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 wonderful as our third party um, uh, counsel has has been, they're not always available to us. Um, they do serve other clients, um, so they we may not be the pressing need on their calendar at that point in time. Um, so having somebody in house does give us much uh, increased access and responsiveness to our emerging needs um, to ensure that we are being consultated in a timely in a timely manner. But I think one of the pieces that uh, becomes a uh, very important that we're kind of missing, it has more to do with uh, familiar familiarity with and the commitment to the mission values and culture of the district. Um, as we continue to move forward, having somebody in those meetings, having somebody who's familiar with our policies. Um, I mean, I know Grant's listening, so no offense to Grant, but he, he, he said a statement in the prior uh, topic about, you know, he wasn't involved in the last chancellor search, so he, he needs to research 
we, you know, if we'd had counsel that was with us during that time, they would be familiar with how we've done things in the past and the reasons why we could and couldn't do things. Um, you know, so I think that would continue to influence and better protect the district, also provide better response times um, to uh, the board as well as the chancellor. Um, the other part that uh, is kind of missing is uh, that intra-district relationships, you know, working within our district, within the colleges, building the relationships, setting a foundation for collaboration, this is gonna help with labor relations, gonna help with collective bargaining. It's gonna help with identifying challenges before they become issues um, so that we can better get to a point where we can uh, head off some potential legal challenges. Whereas as of now, it's kind of waiting until they come up and, and now we're addressing them with our third party um, uh, um, attorneys. So, um, one other thing that we've seen is that although we saw a lull a little bit during uh, the COVID years, um, over the past decade, with, that, with the exception of those, we have seen a continued upward trajectory of uh, legal issues, um, investigations, student issues that boil, boil up to uh, where we need legal input, um, collective bargaining, uh, personnel issues, um, uh, obviously, litigious, uh, litigious, inform, um, uh, litigious events um, that we need to take care of. Um, the one thing that hasn't been really taken care of of late has been um, trainings and professional development activities that could be done from this seat um, to continue to work on our managers at all the uh, locations to ensure we're doing our best at the ground level to be able to uh, head, head off potential issues before they become too, too big. Um, so I guess what we're looking at here is, okay, well, one of the things that we could say is, well, what's the cost difference gonna be? <coughs> In doing an analysis, um, I went through and looked at, you know, what in the past, so up through July uh, or June 30th of last year, for the last couple of years, we're running a rate of, uh, of about $225 an hour for the Office of General Counsel. So that would be um, in-house counsel as well as administrative staff and the costs associated with running that office. Um, this is not including any settlements or things like that, just the, the, the time to do the work. And then we have our rates for our outside counsel. Although we did just get a... a uh, and a letter from um, uh, LCW, um, they're seeing 11 to 14% increase is above these rates that are posted here that will start July 1st as well. Um, while we're paying for in-house counsel uh, to, you know, 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, um, we're not necessarily doing that for our outside counsel. Um, so there, there, there is going to be not a, necessarily an apples to apple correlation when it comes to it, but these last, this last year, um, we're looking at about an average of about $680,000, um, in, in cost, um, for the two years up to the retirement of, of Mr. Hine, we're averaging about 568,000. Now that being said, we just got a, a letter from schools legal with an increase of uh, $42 an hour. Um, and then of course, I just talked about the LCW increase. So we expect that that gap is going to continue to increase as the costs for outside counsel um, per hour increases as well. Additionally, these increases in outsourcing do not include the increased workload to human resources and business services for being more hands-on and being the li liaison between the district and outside counsel. Um, and this takes them away from their core duties and, uh, and the costs associated in the form of potential risk liabilities and exposures, as we are not necessarily the experts in those areas. So I think in summary, I think in-house counsel, general counsel provides numerous benefits to the district that cannot be achieved through piecemealing outsourced legal services with increased risk and liabilities to the district 
In-house counsel assures the board, district, and employees that a dedicated individual serves a single-minded purpose to protect the district's interests, assets, image, and brand. And that is uh, that is my report on an in-house general counsel review. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mike. I have a lot of comments, but I'm going to hold on to those and open up the floor to any trustee who may want to make a statement or ask any questions at this time. Romeo, this is John Corkins. Could I speak? Trustee Corkins, go ahead. <clears throat> Mike, thanks for the presentation. I've reviewed it. It's very thorough and it's very accurate. Chancellor Burke, I think when we did this last time in 2013, I was involved with you on the cost analysis and it was cost effective to move to in-house counsel. But at that time, we also had a concern as a board of trustees about a number of other issues. And then we felt the cost of in-house counsel, uh, whether it was cost effective or not, was justified for the protection of the district and for the efficiency that it, every Mike has brought, summarized it very well. So I've been going to ask for some months now what happened there, because I think we need in-house counsel, regardless of what we've got to do outside. And in-house counsel cannot replace expertise of a Grant Herndon or Eileen O'Hare or some of these others that we still need to bring in for specific issues. So that won't change. It looks like, and if I remember, based on the 225 per hour, in-house counsel with Overhead staffing and so forth was costing us about four hundred fifty thousand a year, Mike. I think roughly, uh, if I remember budget numbers, and we started at about three hundred thousand a year. And Kay, I think, was involved too, and we were looking at saving money. But then we also realized soon it wasn't saving us money, but it was saving us time and pre presented some efficiencies that we don't have without in-house counsel. So I'm very supportive of finding in-house counsel for the board. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Corkins. Are there any other members of the board who wish to make any comments or ask any questions at this time? Um, Romeo? Yes, Trustee Carter, go ahead. So, I, you know, um, I've, I've been kind of back and forth on this all along. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think that we had just such a an ideal guy there with Chris because he had such a great personality and, and abilities. Um, Although a lot of what he did, I, 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 I questioned and I wondered about, um, when I had my large home building company, we, we looked at this back and forth because our, our legal fees were getting so ridiculous and we hired in-house counsel for a while. It worked out fine. And I think it worked out pretty fine with, with Chris, cause he was kind of a, a unique person. Uh, and I, I think that uh, Mike did a, an, a wonderful job on laying this out. And, and I agree with, with, you know, everything he said there and kind of following along with him. Um, but, I, I, you know, I have to say, uh, I'm kind of on the fence on this whole thing, one way or the other. Uh, you know, I see the importance of it, but I, I look at the cost of it, too. And it's not just hiring an attorney. You've got a, a secretary and, and a couple offices and, you know, all the other expenses that go along with it. Um, so if we're careful and nothing bad ever happens, you know, we might skimp through and do okay without it. But, that you know, that never happens. So uh, anyway, uh, that's just my thoughts. I'm kind of on the fence. Thank you, Trustee Carter. Any other questions or comments for members of the board? Uh, Trustee Agablog, uh, this is Kay. I have, Go ahead. you know, you can look at these numbers and everything, but there's an unknown factor there that if we had the in-house, we still don't know what cases are going to come up and how much we're going to need outside counsel. Um, with Abe here now, I'm, and he knows I'm assuming and will, <laughs> we're gonna have a better handle on a lot of our, our HR issues. But I do see that, but Abe, I think you may be filling some of this or plan on it, but we're, we're missed. I, I don't know where we are on that training district wide of how people should handle things so that they don't escalate up to a level of, of even coming to us and then having to it 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 seemed in the past we we used outside counsel a lot even though we had inside mm -hmm. so 
don't know how many questions there are in there, but there it is. Thank you, Trustee Meek. Any others? This is Trustee Jimenez. Go ahead. So I do believe we need an in house council, but we need to be careful on who we select because I would like to see the numbers when we have Chris in house. How much money do we spend in third party in third parties council? Because if we have an in house council and we're still spending a lot of money in third party council, then this wouldn't make much sense. So I, I support having an in-house council as long as we can work with our team to try to limit as much as possible when we go out to the party councils. Thank you, Trustee Jimenez. Any others? Trustee Aguilar. Go ahead, Trustee Gomez Iceberg. Yes, I, I appreciate the thorough analysis. Um, and um, I was looking at the large districts that had in-house counsel. And I, I have to think knowing, knowing something of those operations that there is an efficiency that is gained by having in-house counsel. And there's also um, a cumulative experience with the work that we do and frankly, the players that we have. Um, in our employee, in our community. I, I am in support of an in-house council. I also am in support of maintaining those experts in the legal field that can help us with specific, um, with specific uh, legal matters. And I'm thinking in particular of Liebert Cassidy and, and uh, Eileen O'Hare who has worked with us for so many years, I think has a real sense of our board and um, also a, a, an expertise that is sought out from across California. So I, I, I want the best of both worlds. <clears throat> Thank you, Trustee Gomez Heitzberg. Um, I'd like to jump in and make some comments, if I may, at this time, unless there's somebody else who has something else they want to say. Trustee, uh, Ag Trustee Aguilar, um, Grant Hearn had asked if he could make a couple comments. Sure. Uh, Trustee, I just want to say it makes great sense that you're uh, at the point now where you can revisit this. And just from us, I want to say it's been a privilege to kind of have this enhanced role for a time, but it was put to us as first it was three months and it's kind of been temporary all along. So I think it's great that that you're revisiting whatever you decide. Uh, you knowing what your plan is will help us better organize to serve you. And it would be our goal to the extent you need us externally to be as in-house as possible in terms of relationships and getting to know better what's what's going on within the district. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Uh, and just one technical point also doesn't affect your analysis, but that 350 rate that I uh, passed on to Chancellor Burke for us, our board is revisiting that. We think we may have pegged that a little bit high. Uh, so I'll be letting him know shortly where that stands. And it is higher on the range. You know, we keep track of what the firm's bill. Uh, we came to that rate because we're typically assigning only our more experienced people to you. We don't have partners and associates like they do in private practice, but that's kind of part of the reason for the higher rate. So again, just a, a word of thanks and look forward to, uh, to seeing what you come up with. Thanks for letting me comment. Thank you, Grant. So let me jump into the breach and make my comments now, um, but maybe I'll start with the question to Grant. Grant, you've done work for our district and you've done work for other districts throughout the state. And I gotta ask you a question. Would your commitment to the district's mission and values change if you were in-house counsel or if you continued servicing districts through schools legal services? Commitment. I mean, I'll have to say we we sort of see ourselves as almost in-house with our districts because we get being that we're local and the way that we're involved through our JPA allows us to, to feel like we're part of our districts. But it's also not the same as was pointed out. I mean, we've got you know, 50, 60 districts that we're serving. And so that's not the same as a dedicated person um, who intimately knows everything that's going on at the moment. Um, so again, we, I mean, 
it, it happens naturally that, that we form those contacts, but it's not the same as a single person. So what you're saying is that because you service other districts, does that mean that your commitment to our district is diminished in any way? I mean, I, I, I don't like to think so, but I mean, we're just talking about, uh, you know, it's, it's different than having a person whose entire day is only devoted to KCCD matters, but uh, we're very proud of doing the work for you and, and our relationships with everybody. I'm just realistically. Well, you know, there's been times in the past where I've done work as a consultant for different groups and organizations and businesses. And I can tell you there's been times when I've juggled uh, multiple relationships. And um, even though, you know, I was hired by different groups, I could tell you that whoever I was with at the time was my most important client. And I service people that way. Absolutely. I, um, I've had the opportunity to work in districts that had both in-house legal counsel, KCCD, and outside legal counsel um, through the Delano Elementary School District. And, you know, as I'm hearing Mike's presentation, um, I hear all the points that he's brought up. And frankly, I think it had the opposite effect on me. Uh, where I was like Trustee Carter, maybe on the fence, I think I'm more leaning towards outside counsel for the reasons Mike stated. And I'm going to tell you why. I used to work for the state prison system. And at the time, the state prison system's budget grew exponentially. That budget increased because of lawsuits. Lawsuits filed by inmates who claimed that uh, they were receiving inadequate medical care. And that inadequate medical care resulted in cruel and unusual punishment. A federal judge agreed with the inmates and placed a receiver in control of health care for the state prison system. And rules were changed that held individuals, administrators, and such within the prison personally liable every time there was a misstep on the health care side for the prison system. And doctors as well uh, were held accountable. All that being said, that created a practice and a mantra, which basically, to sum it up, meant when in doubt, send it out. So every doctor, even though we had in-house physicians licensed by the state, some of them specialists, to treat inmates within the prison system, when in doubt, they would send out the inmate to see a physician in the community, usually a specialist, at a premium rate to the state taxpayer. I kind of see similarities in that with the way that we do business in the legal area within our district. We had in-house legal counsel. I can tell you, almost every interaction I had with legal counsel regarding some sort of legal issue got referred out to someone else. And a lot of that, during a lot of that time, we didn't have um, a person with the expertise of Abe Ali in the HR um, position. We had interim folks, people kind of standing in, there was some transition. And I agree with the comment that Trustee Meek made earlier with having Abe in that position, because I think a lot of the issues that we face are personnel related. And we have a vice chancellor of HR who's well aware of the laws related to labor and employment. Another area where we get dinged on a lot is insurance. We have slips and falls. We have fender benders. We have goofy things that happen from time to time, although unfortunate. And our insurance company generally steps in and handles those issues. And insurance companies generally refer these types of cases to their own attorney because after all, they're cutting the check. So what it sounds like to me is rather than have a legal counsel in-house, sounds like we need a legal coordinator. And big difference, I think I'm in agreement, we need legal counsel. I'm just not certain that it needs to be someone in-house. I do see that you know there are a lot of firms 
um, statewide who offer services specifically to school districts. And if there wasn't a niche for that, you know, they wouldn't be in business. Um, and just like schools legal services, you've got an entire team of attorneys who were probably well-versed in certain areas of the law, probably more so than others, but collectively you have a, an A-list of people who can deal with things like construction, labor and employment, contract negotiations, ins um, insurance, um, governance like board policies, and Brown Act, and so on and so forth. I'm sure there's somebody within each law firm like Schools Legal Services who has that expertise. And we can draw on that anytime we need it. Um, Trustee Meek also said that, you know, these types of cases, we can't anticipate uh, what type of lawsuits are coming down the pipeline. We can't anticipate how long litigation is going to take. Um, and all those things, when, when, well, when that happens, we usually send that out to outside legal counsel as well. But simple questions about whether or not um, this committee that we're looking at having a trustee representative sit on, uh, respective of the chancellor CEO search, um, should have been answered in-house. But the answer was provided to us, not by our in-house counsel or not somebody ask, acting as in-house counsel. The clarification came from our vice chancellor of HR. So, you know, I think a lot of the institutional things that were concerns in the presentation could all be addressed by people who work here and have been here for a while, like a chancellor, vice chancellor of HR, your board, so on and so forth. Now, relationships with other districts, so on and so forth. Well, there are outside legal firms who specialize in education, like schools legal services, who, as you just heard from Grant, represents upwards of 50 districts. I don't know how much better networking you need than that. And, you know, you have general counsel inside who, who has communication with the general in-house counsel from other districts while good. I don't see how that's any better or any different than a law firm who has 50 clients within the state and represents them on various issues. I think you still have that expertise. I don't know. Um, some of the issues that were brought up about efficiency, I think what that basically tells me is you got to work on your contracts and get better terms. Um, and, you know, the argument that other districts have the position too doesn't really fly with me. You got to remember, I sit on a county civil service commission that approves positions, job specifications, qualifications, salary ranges. And I've heard this argument from departments throughout county government that Mono County, Inyo County, or uh, San Bernardino County, Riverside County has this position, therefore we need it too. It's not always true. I think, you know, if we want efficiencies, we've just got to demand it. Now, I've also had conversations, I appreciate Trustee Carter's comments about his struggles as a personal uh, and, and private business with in-house counsel and outside counsel. And I've had conversations with attorneys on this matter. And I can tell you that, you know, if it were me and it was my business and I needed an attorney, I'd want the best attorney that I can afford. I'd want a shark and I, I, I'd accept nothing less. Well, you know, when we post a position for general counsel at the salary range that we offer, it's a generous salary. But a lot of attorneys in private practice would not leave their lucrative law practices to take a haircut and come work in-house for KCCD. We would be getting a different type of attorney. So, you know, to me, I like the freedom and flexibility of being, to go, being able to go out, interview firms, hold them accountable. If we're happy with their services, we keep them. If we're not, we replace them. We could always dictate terms and negotiate rates. We could always set a cap on the services. We could always do a lot of things that are creative that make sense for both sides. And 
you know, when we talk about the individual rates and how there's increases from schools legal and increases from Liebert Cassidy, um, I, I'm not disputing that. That happens. But we also are in government where folks in government get an annual pay increase regardless. They get COLA. They get negotiated um, percentage increases. So our rates go up too. So I'm not quite sure that, you know, the comparison of rates really holds water with me. But now um, there's some other concerns that I would have, but I'd, I'd just pause and allow anybody else to jump in. But that's where I stand. I think I'm leaning more and more towards legal counsel. I may be in the minority, but at the end of the day, I think, you know, uh, for our staff and the lawyers in the, in the Zoom chat room, uh, know that I have concerns and I would hope that they would work really hard to address those things. So with that, I'll pause. Wait, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Um, you, you mentioned an, an organizer or facilitator. I think that's an excellent idea. We actually did that. We hired a, a, a paralegal to come in and uh, work as kind of a liaison between, you know, as anything legal came in, it landed on her desk and she, she dealt with it. Um, so maybe that's a way we could go here as kind of an in-between. And there's, and there's all this work that comes in. It has to go somewhere. It has to land on somebody's desk. And it's, it's difficult when you already have a job and then, you know, something comes up, you're expected to handle this emergency job that came in. So maybe it would be good to hire a, a coordinator or a paralegal or somebody, an in-between person. The part, the part that bothers me about hiring somebody is the turnover that we've had there at the college too is is you get you get this this special person that you find and then you educate them and they learn all about your the culture of, of where they're working at and then they they quit and they go find another job somewhere else we have to start all over with square one so you know i some of these arguments don't fly with me too much Thank you, Trustee uh, Carter. You know, to speak to a paralegal or a coordinator, I mean, we have Suzanne Galindo, um, who's been sort of serving in that function now for a while. And uh, I think she's plenty capable of uh, coordinating and determining, you know, what department certain things land in. We get issues with personnel as she works with aid. And, you know, there's maybe a little clarity that needs to happen within our own internal staff about figuring out where things need to go and who. I mean, I know we have an item uh, later on our agenda in closed session related to a lawsuit that we were made aware of uh, a few meetings ago, and uh, we're just now getting an update today. Uh, you know, I've been very curious to find out uh, who's been working on that issue for us and uh, who made the call to do what. Um, I'd like to know a lot. And, um, you know, I, I kind of get the feeling sometimes that folks that are on contract or on retainer sometimes are a little more responsive. Um, not knocking anybody in particular, but I mean, that's just the way I function. But um, that's just me. This is Trustee Jimenez. Go ahead. Well, it makes sense. Maybe we can go with the law firm and see if they have a lawyer that can be a part-time in-house lawyer, perhaps like work 20 hours a week to help us navigate whatever we need to. And then everything else do it through a third party law firm that requires it. So, Trustee Aguilar, can I, can I speak? Go ahead. Uh, I think based on the feedback from the board so far, is what I'd like to do is uh, is uh, convene with my vice chancellors to look at a, a potential couple of options. I think I think the key is is what we miss in the um, general counsel is the global coordination and as well as the ability to get uh, answers to um, kind of you know uh, simple legal questions quickly. Uh, I think that has been uh, what we've missed by not having, you know, general counsel sitting here in house. 
Um, what I'd like to it, work with the vice chancellors to explore uh, some kind of potential um, hybrid medium, as uh, suggested by your by Trustee Aguilar and uh, and Yovani, uh, as well as Trustee Carter, and then uh, see if we can find a potential solution that kind of meets the needs, um, but also meets the desires of the various trustees. You know, uh, Tom, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, I know that this function is very different than the practice of law, but there's another skill set that is highly sought after that I think a lot of organizations experience a lot of turnover in this particular area um, and just as important in a lot of ways, but IT. IT positions are very hard to fill within government service because folks usually use government jobs to kind of get their feet wet and then they're recruited to go into the private sector. Um, and it's very hard. Even private sector HR or, or IT companies have difficulty retaining people uh, because they're always, because they're in such high demand, they command a good salary and they can go basically wherever they want and uh, get their quote paid. Um, but if you're in an organization, you need your internet, you need your computer files, you need to be able to email, your phone systems need to work. And we encounter those types of issues daily, even within the college system. I, I did it too. Um, and getting somebody to respond, sometimes there's a lag um, and there's deficiencies, but I was finally able to find a vendor, um, you know, shameless plug for Grapevine MSP, but in the negotiations of an agreement with them, I made for certain that I had a single point of contact that I could contact right away who would be responsive. And if that person was unavailable, vacation, out to lunch or sick or whatever, there was a number two person. So I can tell you, I know IT is different from practicing law, but when we have agreements in place, we have to make certain that we have a point of contact that's always available to us. Um, just like we would want a doctor who's on emergency call. There's gotta be somebody who'll pick up the call, at least take down what the issue is and work through it. So, you know, I think we should have conversations with outside firms. And I think schools legal services should be thrown into that pool where we should have a conversation in terms of these are our needs. Uh, can your uh, law firm service our needs? And if the answer is yes, let's work through a discussion of what that would look like uh, rather than, you know, continue to try to make, you know, this just square peg fit in a round hole of figuring out a way to make in-house legal counsel work. Because I think moving forward, I mean, We've got a couple of lawsuits. We are, we're all familiar with those lawsuits and they're gonna take a lot of time and a lot of work. Um, all of those cases are gonna be handled by outside firms. So, you know, it's not like our general counsel is gonna be going to court and arguing on our behalf. Um, and that's how I feel. I mean, I've seen this issue both ways and I can tell you um, there's one scenario that I'm more happy with than the other. Trustee Agbala. Go ahead, Trustee Corkin. Yeah, Tom echoed kind of where I was going on this. I remember, Tom, that Chris used to give us an annual summary of the hours spent. And I was going to ask Mike and Abe, but I know that in-house counsel spend a lot of time reviewing contracts, reviewing employment contracts, and doing a lot of the day-to-day. -day. And, uh, <clears throat> and that gave us the strength of that day-to-day, -day, able to go to somebody, also helped us with our foundation boards and and minutes, bylaws, things like that. If we got into something that was more specific, Brown Act, we went to Grant. If we had something that's more specific on a other issue, we got Eileen or we went elsewhere. Um, and, and to echo what Kyle said, I agree. We, we, we use an in-house firm, but I have them on retainer. They're at my beck and call for day-to-day -day contracts, small issues, and so forth. And then I have Another firm I use that's got a group of about 40 attorneys, and we use them for specialty items if we have to go HR, if we go into legality, water, things like that. So 
maybe there's a compromise here, but I think I think if Tom can talk with the vice chancellors and get us a sense, and Tom, maybe we can find what uh, Chris was doing. I remember we thought it was money well spent when we looked at all the hours he was doing with his people to review contracts and so forth. Now, maybe, maybe it's a different day and time, but uh, there is no one attorney that's going to do all for you. There's just no way. And uh, the outside fees you're looking at are cheap in my mind because we pay a lot more than that for the folks we use out of Fresno and Sacramento. So, uh, but I like Tom's suggestion, uh, Trustee Agbalog. Let's talk with the vice chancellors and let's not make a decision today, but let's not leave this subject. Let's keep looking into it and see what we think the best compromise might be. Thank you, Trustee Corkins. If I may share, uh, I'd be more inclined if Tom wanted to sit down with the vice chancellors and really define a scope of work and define areas where there are deficiencies and things that they would like addressed. And later down the road, uh, perhaps you know we can continue the conversation of whether outside legal counsel can, or an outside firm, maybe that's the proper term, whether outside firms can can meet the needs of what it is that we want. Um, that, I mean, just from our experience here, at least my experience has been, I mean, we've had in-house legal counsel, a person who's paid for by the district and most almost everything gets referred out to somebody else. And to your point, I mean, there's just some groups that have more expertise in certain areas than others. Um, maybe, I, th I think we're all in agreement. We need legal counsel. I just, I don't think at this point, I'd support that legal representation being in-house paid by us as an employee. I mean, certainly maybe the structure that you have in your business is the best way to do it where you have somebody who's on retainer and uh, you use them as you need them. And maybe there's somebody within their, their law firm that's an expert in the subject that you, know, you really need. Uh, but maybe we can revisit that conversation at a later date, but maybe it, right now, just to find the scope of work. Romeo, I have a question. Sure. Uh, me. Chancellor Burke, is this something you can uh, bring back to us with a report in our, our August meeting? Yeah, I believe I could. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, so with that, any other comments, questions uh, from members of the board? Okay. If there are none, then I think that this item doesn't require any action, but Tom, do you feel like you have sufficient direction from the board to proceed? Absolutely, yes. Okay. <clears throat> Give me here, I'm toggling on my screen here, going back to the, uh, agenda so we're at public comments trustee oh, very good bear with me here i'm switching all right uh so we'll go to item number two public comments and this is a uh, open session agenda items only uh the public may address the board of trustees on each of the agenda items at this time or as those items are considered each speaker will be allowed a Maximum of five minutes per topic. 20 minutes shall be the maximum time allotment for public speakers on any one subject, regardless of the number of speakers at any time. Uh, or at any, um, any one board meeting. At the discretion of a majority of the board, these times may be extended. Each person who addresses the board must first be recognized by the presiding officer. Comments must be addressed to the board as a whole and not to individual members or district employees. The board and staff are not obligated to comment on or respond to or address comments by the public. At the opening of this meeting, names and agenda items were taken for public comments. Are there any additional members of the public who wish to make public comments? Please state your name uh, and the item you wish to address. Chancellor Burke. Trustee Aglog, no one has signed up to address the board at this time. Okay, very good. So uh, we will jump over to three business services approval other than construction. Letter A, authorization for the chief financial officer to enter into a multi-project funds in cooperative research and development agreement 
between the Kern Community College District and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. The term is August 8, 2023 through August 7, 2028, and the cost of the district is not to exceed uh, $2.5 million to be paid from the RP040 Restricted Program Fund. Move for approval. We have a Second. motion by Trustee uh, Second. Meeks, seconded by Trustee Corkins. Jennifer, will you pull the board? Yes. Trustee Corkin? Aye. Trustee Meek? Aye. Trustee Carter? Aye. Trustee Gomez Heitzberg? Aye. Trustee Jimenez? Aye. Trustee Aguilar? Aye. That concludes the vote. Thank you. Next item is letter B, authorization for the chief financial officer to execute a service agreement between the current community college district and academic search for executive search services. The term is from June 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2024. The cost of the district is not to exceed $139,000 to be paid from the GU001 unrestricted fund. No move. We have a motion to approve by Trustee Meek. Is there a second? Trustee Corkins, I'll second with a question. Okay. We have a second by Trustee Corkins. Go ahead with your question. Uh, Tom, I assume Abe, you or Abe secured these guys. That just seems like a big price compared to what we paid in the past. Is this pretty standard now? So I'm going to defer to Trustee or uh, Vice Chancellor Ali to address that question, John. Thank you. Yeah, they, these national firms. Um, command a price, a premium price. And um, I, I, I tried to squeeze out as much as I could get clarification. <laughs> I actually took 25% off of that amount. Wow. There was a clause in there that was written that anybody who applies for another job that's in this pool, would they would get a 25% retainer on top of that. So um, yeah. I, I went through it thoroughly with this group. Um, I know it's a firm that we want. Um, they're top notch uh, nationally. So that's, that's the kind of money that you're gonna spend versus a California firm, which would be yeah. probably 75% of what, yeah. what that amount is. Uh, the, the term is to June, 2024. I, don't, I assume there's no discount if we don't need them all the way to June 2024. This is the fee. Right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. I, that, that's why I, I figured that was the issue because I know I'm used to seeing 50, 60, 70,000 for these searches. It seems yeah. pretty high. Okay. This is one of those. We got to bite the bullet and go for it because with, we got we to go higher. I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> okay. Perfect. So we have a motion in a second. Uh, Jennifer, will you pull the board? Yes. Trustee Corkin? Yes. Trustee Meek? Yes. Trustee Carter? Oh, yes. Trustee Gomez Heisberg? Yes. Trustee Jimenez? Yes. Trustee Agla? Aye. That concludes the vote. Thank you. Next item is letter C, authorization for the chief financial officer to execute a service agreement between the Kern Community College District and, and the statewide association of community colleges to provide the district's property and liability insurance. The term is from July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2026. And the cost of the district is not to exceed $4,175,316 to be funded from the GU001 unrestricted fund. Corkins, move approval. We have a motion to approve by Trustee Corkins. Is there a second? Second, Gomez Heitzberg. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Jennifer, will you pull the board? Yes, Trustee Corkins. Aye. Trustee Meek. Aye. Trustee Carter. Aye. Trustee Gomez Heitzberg. Aye. Trustee Jimenez. Aye. Trustee Avila. Aye. That concludes the vote. Thank you. Next item is letter D, authorization for the chief financial officer to enter into a 
uh, interjurisdictional exchange agreement between the Kern Community College District and California Community College's Chancellor's Office for Craig Hayward to serve as a strategic advisor to the Chancellor and Deputy Chancellor for the, for the California Community College system. The term is from July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2025. The district will be reimbursed up to $386,400 to be deposited into the GU001 unrestricted fund. Move for approval. I'll second that with a question again. We have a motion by Trustee uh, Meek, seconded by Trustee Corkins. Trustee Corkins, go ahead. Tom or whoever put this, I don't understand what we're doing here. This I've never seen this before. Can you explain to me mm -hmm. and this individual, his value to them versus us? So, uh, Trustee Corkins, uh, uh, this is a, uh, a temporary uh, loaning of a uh, um, employee uh, from our district to the state chancellor's office to work on a statewide initiatives. Um, many of those initiatives that we have an interest in as well. Uh, we will uh, be uh, backfilling with an interim into this position. So um, that's essentially uh, the genesis for this. Mike, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. I, no, I, Tom, I think you covered it exceptionally well. I just, I was just concerned, does it leave a hole in our system to try and backfill? Have we got somebody in mind, somebody internal, or what's your ideas? I, I'm confident that we will be able to backfill this uh, position successfully. Okay, thank you. So we have a motion in a second for another questions or comments from the board. Jennifer, we pull the board, please. Yes, Trustee Corkins. Aye. Trustee Meek. Aye. Trustee Carter? Aye. Trustee gomez Heitzel. Aye. Trustee Jimenez? Aye. Trustee Aguilar? Aye. That concludes the Thank you. Next item for business services approval, letter A, authorization for the chief financial officer to reject all bids for the Bakersfield College Agriculture Building Project. I'll move in favor of the motion. I'll we second have a motion. it with a question. Yeah, I've got Mer a question. Go ahead. M motion by Trustee uh, Corkin, seconded by Trustee Meek with questions. Go ahead. Explain this one to me. Yeah, I was going to ask the same thing. My, I'm going to defer to CFO uh, Giacomini to explain. So uh, we went out to bid for the uh, science and engineering, I'm sorry, not the ag, ag building. And unfortunately, when the bids came in, they came in. Um, in excess of $10 million over what we had budgeted for and expected and several hundred dollars per square foot higher than what we have been doing in our other projects of, of late. Um, we believe that the timing um, of this going out to bid uh, was part of the challenge is, is that we're extremely busy in, the, in our local area. We believe that rebidding this and potentially looking at the delivery method as a potential change um, for later this fall will uh, could reel us some better results. Um, we, we are anticipating that it'll be potentially higher than we had budgeted, but um, where we are currently is, is, uh, is gonna be a big challenge to the remainder of the Measure J program. Okay. Okay. Any further comments or questions? Yeah, I got a comment. I, I'm just gonna say, well, we're here. We knew it was coming, and uh, now we have to deal with it. You know, deal with the fallout of it. So, I think this this is just the beginning. Okay, Jennifer, will you pull the board? Yes, Trustee Corkin. Aye. Trustee Me. Aye. Trustee Carter. Aye. Trustee Gomez Hensford. Aye. Trustee Jimenez. Aye. Trustee Agla. Aye. Thank you. Next item is five educational services approval letter A, authorization for the chief financial officer to enter into an agreement between the current community college district on behalf of Bakersfield College 
and the National Science Foundation for the Foundation's Improving Undergraduate STEM Education Hispanic Serving Institutions Program. The term of the award is from June 1st, 2023 through May 31st, 2025. The total grant award is $400,000 to be deposited into a new restricted program fund. Move approval. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second, Corkins. Okay. Jennifer, will you pull the board? Yes, Trustee Corkins. Aye. Trustee Meek. Aye. Trustee Carter. Aye. Trustee Gomez Heisberg. Aye. Trustee Jimenez. Aye. Trustee Aguilar. Aye. That concludes the vote. Thank you. So that brings us to six public comments, and this is public comments regarding items in closed session only. Uh, Chancellor Burke. No one has signed, uh, Trustee Aglog, no one has signed up to address the board at this time. Okay, very good. So then I will go ahead and close the public comment portion, and we are going to adjourn into closed session. I assume everybody has a link to jump into the closed session. Is that correct? Yep, that's correct. Okay, that's very good. We will uh, meet in closed session here momentarily. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.
Jennifer, Tom, do we have all the trustees back in the uh, open session? Looks like it to me, like everybody's back. Yeah, it sure looks like it. Uh, is Tom on? I don't see Tom. I see everybody else. Okay. Let's wait for Tom to log in and then we'll reconvene. Okay, Tom, you're back. So uh, are all the trustees back in open session? Yes. Okay, excellent. So the board will reconvene into open session. And uh, the uh, board considered some items in closed session. Uh, and here's the reporting out. The board took action in closed session to accept a settlement offer signed by the plaintiff in Kern County Superior Court case number BCV-20-102220 for payment of the agreed settlement amount in exchange for a full release of all claims and dismissal of the court action. So that concludes all of the items uh, taken into uh uh, taken up by the board in closed session and um, unless there's anything else i think that go ahead that concludes our meeting and we're hereby adjourned thank you thank you thank you all